by 30%. And uh, NYU has always tried in different ways to be more sustainable. And recently, NYU has signed the American College and University President's climate commitment to be climate neutral by the year 2040, facing our large energy demand, about 44 megawatts each year. This is a quite ambitious goal and cannot be achieved without involvement in such um, renewable energy projects. So today we propose that solar projects would be an optimal choice for NYU to take now, to take the pledge that NYU made. Now, as Yuki here has mentioned, investing in solar will help NYU make progress towards the sustainability goals. Now, what about the school's endowment goal or financial goals, which are equally just as important? Now, let's start by looking at the school's endowment fund, which currently stands at $3.1 billion. The endowment fund is divided into four categories, equity, real assets, opportunistic credit, and fixed income. Now, each class has its own goal or target as well, which is shown in the purple column graph. Now, if you look carefully, equity and fixed income have already exceeded the target, <coughs> while opportunistic and credit is only 1% short. On the other hand, real asset is the only class that is significantly below its target. It's 5% or $155 million short. Now, solo PV is considered a real asset. So investing in them would also help make the school, will also help, um, the school make progress towards its endowment goal. Now, what's more important than achieving all these goals is that investing in solar makes economic sense, and it fits in with NYU's long-term investment approach. And that's because solar assets have very low risk and they produce very similar returns. 
now before we jump into the specific of the returns, let's talk a little bit more about the solar industry and how that may even impact the timeline of when and why you should invest in solar projects. The solar industry is a quickly growing market. In total, there are now 4.6 million average American homes that, are that could be powered by solar energy. In just the beginning of the first half of 2015, over 780,000 American homes and businesses are now powered by solar. This growth has changed dramatically from 2010 until 2015, and there are three main reasons for this growth. The first is that costs have fallen for solar panels dramatically from the 1970s until now, which you can see in the first two graphs. The second is that with this decrease in cost, utility companies and small third-party solar companies were able to offer more, um, more options for solar for their consumers. The third is that federal and state regulations have stabilized and generally gotten better. Um, the third graph here shows the differences between residential utility and commercial solar, with the green being the highest of utility um, that has given the most solar energy in the recent years. However, the market is changing to focus more on small commercial panels. This is because there is less risk involved in commercial because of the size of the arrays as well as the cost. That's why we are specifically looking at commercial solar panels for NYU specifically. Also, you can see in the third graph that there has been historical increase in 2015 as well as historical projected increase in 2016. However, it is de decreasing dramatically in 2017, and this is because of the fall of the Federal Investment Tax Credit, which Adi will talk about now. Uh, the most talked about thing in the solar industry at the moment is this I, um, I, uh, the ITC expiration. The ITC is set to plunge from 30% to 10% for commercial installations and to 0% for residential sector. Now, this will cause the system to become much more expensive because you're essentially losing the 30%. So, you know, this will cause the build rate to drop. As you can see here from 2016 to 2017, uh, uh, there are many estimates about what is going to happen. Bloomberg estimated that the build rate will decrease by two-thirds, while the Wall Street Journal predicted that it will decrease by a quarter. And because of this, a lot of businesses are rushing to install in 2016. And also because they believe that it may take a few additional years for new incentives and technological advancements to help reduce the post-ITC price to the same level as the pre-ITC price. And because of this, we strongly encourage NYU to consider going solar in 2016 as well. And now that we have set the foundation, my colleagues here will jump into the details of the how and why and why you could do so. Besides the federal incentive that Adi has to talk about, is the ITC covering 30% of the system cost. Another important governmental support from incentive is state incentive. We are go over projects based in three states, which are New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. These states have the highest incentive among all countries and are always among the top ten solar markets. We can see from the chart that um, all three states have 100% property and sales tax exemption and a lot of rebates, loans, low interest loans and um, grants programs. Also, in addition to that, New York has a specific incentive program that will give the property owners an extra 14 cent per watt energy produced. Also, New, Jer New Jersey and Massachusetts have asteroid based financing incentives programs that in which that solar developers will receive certificates for the energy produced and then they can trade the certificates in the market in exchange of actual solar incomes. The asterisk price is based on the local markets. M Massachusetts now have the highest asterisk price and is among the is regarded as the strongest solar in market in the US. The combination of IPC and state incentives from these states can cover at least half of the system, system cost, making the projects more financially viable. So given the three incentive structures in Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey that Yuki just mentioned, there are three ways for NYU to go solar. The first of which is through uh, New York becoming an independent power producer. 
where it invests a significant portion of its endowment into solar assets outside of the New York City area, somewhere in Massachusetts, New Jersey, or even upstate New York, where it can profit off of energy sales to a third party. The second method is for NYU to become a direct owner of that solar power uh, and locate an installation inside of New York City so it can use the energy produced through remote net metering and potentially even sale, sell that energy back to the utility, Con Ed. The third method uh, requires no upfront investment um, and also can only happen in New York City. It's NYU purchasing <coughs> Uh, energy from a solar asset on a longer timeline. So a new development project that happens in New York City's energy zone. Uh, new NYU sets up a long-term agreement, about 20, 25 years, where it will purchase that energy at a discounted rate. I'll explain a little bit more about direct ownership and uh, power purchase agreements a little bit later on, and focus specifically on independent power producing right now. As you can see, it sort of fits into this graph here on models for NYU. So NYU is an independent power producer. Um, there are, is about $155 million that could be reallocated within the endowment, as Adi mentioned, that could be directly invested in solar real assets. Those assets in other locations around the country could receive 8 to 10% returns on the investment through the sale of a partnership with a real estate investment trust. Through that agreement, um, NYU sees profitable returns on an investment in solar and goes green in a very financial way. I'll let Emily talk a little bit more about real estate investment trusts and why they're such a key component in an um, independent power production model. Uh, Urban Edge has about 83 of these properties that span about 15 million square feet. Uh, and but what's even more important is the fact that these properties are located along the Washington, D.C. to Boston corridor. Now, recall this is important because, as my colleague Yuki stated earlier, uh, these, uh, this area uh, includes a concentration of states that have very high solar incentives, Massachusetts and New Jersey. So uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll look more into the specific property. Uh, so the specific property we chose uh, for Urban Edge is the East Hanover Warehouse. It has about 940,000 uh, square feet worth of roof space, which is good for a large solar installation. Um, it's located in New Jersey, so as David stated earlier, uh, it's a good opportunity for NYU to use the independent power producing uh, option because it can't directly use that energy. So uh, because it's located in New Jersey, uh, the property benefits from the abstract market, as you stated earlier, at about $275, megawatt hours, uh, $275 per megawatt hour, which is substantial considering the system size is about 2.86 megawatts. Uh, so there are a lot of numbers and figures on this slide, but what you really want to focus on is uh, the lifetime energy savings for Urban Edge, which is about $2.6 million. And this in IRR, which stands for Internal Rate of Return. So this is important because NYU uh, would invest in this project uh, as an independent power producer, and it would set up a power purchase agreement with Urban Edge, so Urban Edge would receive discounted energy while NYU gets economic profit. I will now hand the torch over to Nafisa, <laughs> and she will discuss another property in DDR. So DDR is another one of the REITs that Emily had described. It has a bunch of um, shopping centers throughout the country. Um, they also have a green team that's involved in helping DDR and its tenants uh, practice sustainable efforts. One of the projects that they've involved themselves in is um, 13 different solar arrays in 13 different properties. So given their high, high energy consumption and their commitment to expanding solar projects, they make a viable um, option for NYU as a, for NYU's partner in solar. So one of the properties that we looked at was Home Depot at Great Way Center in Massachusetts. This is a 644 kilowatt system that would cost NYU $1.1 million. And when you could start receiving returns on this project through a power purchase agreement 
with DDR. DDR would buy um, energy from NYU for 20 years at a 15% discount. Um, the project would also require monetizing the ITC through a tax equity partner. Um, this project also gains revenue through ASFRAX, the most lucrative market, as Yuki has mentioned, is in Massachusetts. The ASFRAX market would give NYU $2 million towards return on the project. Um, the most important number to look at is the after-tax IRR, which is 16.26%. Looking at the difference between pre-tax and after-tax IRR, it's obvious that the ITC is very important to making this project viable and economical. So to now we'll explain a little more about the inputs that we use for a model for creating these um, projected outcomes. Thank you. Um, so these charts were taken from the financial model we used to calculate cash flow. The pre-tax cash flow takes, takes into account the $2,000 gain from SRX spread over the first 10 years. Um, also, it takes into account system degradation over time, which makes the system less efficient, and also various miscellaneous expenses, like roof lease. The after-tax cash flow um, accounts for tax income and liability, including the $460,000 gain from the um, investment tax credit. And in the final line, which is cumulative after-tax cash flow, you can see the system becomes profitable after about four to six years which is reflective of the 4.7 year payback period um, for a total cash flow of about $1.2 million. So now that we've explained two options in NYU as an independent power producer, we want to further outline how NYU could become a direct owner. Um, one of the unique elements of New York and University going as a direct owner is that the asset would have to be located inside of New York Independent State Operators, NISO, uh, NISO Zone J. Um, basically, the New York metropolitan area. Once that asset is located inside of New York City and NYU has invested in it to build the system, uh, it can use that energy through remote net metering, legislation that ultimately allows NYU to be credited for all of the energy that it produces by Con Ed or another utility. Uh, one of the examples that we chose for uh, direct ownership is at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I'll let Tim Dobbs explain that. So this Zone J property is operated by the Brooklyn Navy Yard and permanently occupied by Steiner Studios. The Brooklyn Navy Yard has issued three goals for sustainability that help make this project an attractive site for solar development. It hopes to develop a green strategy that will reduce its environmental footprint to become a national model for sustainable industrial parks and to attract tech-driven and socially responsible companies. So the project we propose is a 1.1 megawatt system. The total expenses are about $1.5 million, taking into account a $600,000 investment tax credit um, gain. And uh, NYU would be accredited $0.14 cents per kilowatt hour produced by the system over a 25-year period for a total savings of about $2.5 million, and the internal rate of return is 14%, and the payback time is 5.4 years. And the cash flow is very similar to that of the Gateway Center. Um, however, New York does not have an SRX program, so instead we accounted for the New York Sun Megawatt Block um, Incentive, which is a production-based incentive, where NYU would receive $0.40 cents per watt produced by the system, and as the system is 1.1 megawatts, NYU would receive $440,000 for installing the system. Um, there is one final method for NYU to go solar, which is through the power purchase agreement. Uh, the best way to explain a power purchase agreement is to flip the independent power producer model that we first started with. So instead of NYU investing up front in an energy asset, it partners with a developer that is building a project somewhere in New York City and agrees to purchase the energy on a lengthy timeline, so between 20 and 25 years, so that that investor can uh, receive consistent returns at 10%. Um, this is uh, an easy way for NYU to go solar because it requires no upfront cost and 
allows NYU to profit from energy savings in discounted energy prices. Um, it could easily be applied to the model within the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, just through a power purchase agreement instead of NYU's upfront investment. Um, I'll let Napisa explain why all of these option, options are so vital to consider at this moment and why we've eliminated them for you. So, in summary, we believe that it's due time that NYU makes more robust changes towards its commitment to become climate neutral by 2040. With the recent decisions put forward by the Conference of the Parties, there is an ever more need to reduce carbon emissions. This is where we believe that NYU can hold its place as a, a financially and environmentally responsible leader within its global network. Accordingly, we um, ask NYU to take one of three options. One is to take its endowment fund and invest in a solar asset, where, um, on, put the asset on top of a roof owned by REIT, it would also um, be buying the solar energy. Or that solar asset can be placed in New York for NYU to use and save on energy and potentially sell back some energy to Con Ed. If investing from the endowment fund does not seem appropriate, we ask NYU to at least consider a power purchase agreement with a solar developer that would own the asset but allow NYU to save in energy and become a responsible renewable energy user. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So this is a wonderful presentation and a very clear case. Uh, one of the things that seem to be missing is some comparative analysis against what we currently do. And I was wondering if you could provide two particular numbers. One was, so you made a, made a claim that uh, it, solar provides this you know, 8 to 10 percent return as an alternative real asset. How does that compare with the real assets that we're currently holding? And my second question, uh, talking about the idea of perhaps purchasing our own solar power at some of the rates that you, uh, you provided, how does that compare against what we currently have, which is our recently built cogeneration plant and supplement from Con Ed? All right, so great question. I'll answer the first part of it. So what NYU invests in are real estates, right? Um, you know, that's considered a real asset as well. And you can see from this chart is that real estates are very wealthy. They move up and down all the time. And right now, the real estate market is at all time high. And when it's high, that signals trouble, right? As you can see, their financial crisis in 2008, you know, 2009, it dropped. But essentially, what we're asking you right now is that, you know, with solar assets, you're essentially locking yourself down for 20 years. You know what you will get for 20 years unless the system breaks, which most likely will not happen. And we have asked you to partner with the REIT. And with the REIT, they have good credit ratings and huge public companies. They will, you know, 99.5% sure will pay you for those 20 years. And also because we're giving them discount on the energy. So why would, you know, they, they have no reason to break the contract. So I hope that answers the first part of your question. And can I ask you to clarify again what was the second question so we can better answer it? So there's just a question, you know, you presented some cost per kilowatt hour for some of these solar options. What is the cost per kilowatt hour for what we're currently doing? Okay. So the blended rate for NYU's energy supply is 21 cents. Um, that's incorporating all of the fees that NYU pays to Con Edison for distribution uh, for uh, regulated somewhere around 8 cents. Um, yeah. Around, around eight cents, so it's a little bit less than the energy supply rate from, from Con Ed. Um, so the savings we accumulate through a solar energy asset um, would be profitable through, through that off offset. More questions? Hi, it was a great presentation. Um, I'm wondering, you've been talking about NYU making decisions about investing its endowment. I wonder if you can say something about the process that the decision makers for investing the endowment might follow. And I'm just, because I'm wondering what kinds of obstacles might you encounter in terms of convincing them? So like the who are they and how 
uh, interested might they be in going solar? No matter how convincing the case might sound to us as an audience, what would you anticipate as obstacles at that level? Okay, so I guess one of the obstacles that you would face is that, um, as I mentioned, the ITC. With the ITC, you need tax advertising. And NYU doesn't have tax advertising because you're a non-profit school, you're not paying any tax. But this, we have found a solution to this, that you can partner with a tax equity investor, and with a tax equity investor is that they will essentially buy the system on your behalf, and then you can either lease it back, NYU can lease it back, or just buy it back out after a few years. So that is one of the biggest obstacles that we see at least. But then in terms of bureaucracy here at NYU, um, all of the investments are handled by investment officers who serve on behalf of the board of trustees. And so all decisions would inevitably have to go through them and then get approved by the board. Um, the $155 million that needs to be reallocated within the endowment would take um, significant, significant consideration uh, in order for them to make a decision that big. Um, I mean, it's likely they would uh, undergo an experimental uh, phase with solar investments, and if it proved profitable from an 8 to 10% margin, they would continue that. Um, I think most of the the work from there is really just showing them that it's consistent profitability, uh, consistent and s consistent, reliable, stable return that you can receive from a, a solar investment. And once that is proven, uh, you can't really do much to prevent them from continuing that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is to follow on Andrew and Ann uh, in great presentation. But um, so in that realm of sort of comparative and decision making, what kind of precedents are there? like by the uh, Board of Trustees or the investing office, and maybe is there a way to tie this into divestment, or? So, uh, as of yet, I don't know of any precedent for significantly reallocating funds within the endowment. Right. Um, this could work reasonably well with the case for divest, uh, to reallocate some of the funds that are in fossil fuels and put them into renewable energy. Um, in terms of the uh, timeline that that will take uh, and like how to work it in with divestment per se, it's not. A, I'm not really sure that like the organism that it would have to come from an NYU divest perspective to get there, um, or that divest would have to mandate this as, as one of uh, the demands. So um, I think as soon as they are, uh, as soon as they see the profitability behind the solar investment, they'll ultimately reorganize the endowment the way that they see best. So it's not our call on how they'll divest the um, holdings they currently have. Um, they'll go about it in their own sort of analytical way. Does that answer your question? Um, so here's a here's a comment that a short comment that you may have a comment about, and uh, the short comment is that you may know that Hampshire College has just gone entirely solar, and in the rhetoric of moving to an entirely solar energy system, the rhetoric has been to stop talking about divestment and instead talk about provestment, and um, and I wonder if that might be a, a, a better way of capturing what it is you're advocating rather than the divestment of it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I could speak off the cuff as a member of NYU Divest, <laughs> <laughs> or I, I could talk as a me I speak as a member of the, the NYU Solar Team. Um, I can see both sides. Um, I think ultimately, <laughs> From a moral perspective, divest has a very valuable argument um, that there is math behind the uh, like the assets that fossil fuel companies hold. They hold five times more uh, energy, or five times more uh, coal, oil, and, and natural gas than we can safely burn without putting the uh, temperature over two degrees Celsius. Uh, two degrees Celsius increase. Okay, so hi, thanks for coming. Uh, just really quickly, the three of them are going to be speaking for all of us, um, but we're just going to introduce our whole group. Uh, so I'm Tatiana.
Bios. I'm Nicole Joseph. I'm Louise Paul. I'm Louise Arenka. I'm Audrey Wright. So is Nicole. Elise Traven. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to our presentation. We worked really hard this semester, so we really appreciate it. Um, as Tatiana said, Elise, Summer, and I are going to be presenting on behalf of our group. Um, we'll be presenting a little bit about the issue we've taken up this semester, the choices we made in our data collection, our findings, and our recommendations. So this semester, our group of seven NYU Environmental Studies students performed an observational survey of single-use disposable bag consumption in New York City. Uh, for our client, the Bag at NYC Coalition, who we'll tell you a little bit more about later on in the presentation. Um, we spent this semester essentially researching and doing field work to both offer the coalition a picture of what New York City's disposable bag consumption looks like today, as well as use our acquired knowledge of the issue, as well as our knowledge base as students of environmental studies to offer big picture recommendations to the coalition. So what is the issue? As environmentalists, we are deeply concerned with the production, consumption, and disposal of single-use disposable bags in New York City, where we live and where we realize that changes in consumption have great impact as people look to New York City as a progressive city that has been successful in implementing environmental strategies to its 8 million residents. So a little bit about plastic bags in particular. Each year, 100 billion plastic bags are used in the United States. 5.2 billion of those plastic bags are used in New York City alone. And plastic bags make up 2% of New York City's waste stream, which may not sound like a huge number, but when you realize that this statistic is calculated by weight, and plastic bags weigh very, very little, you realize that this is a lot of plastic bags. Additionally, Plan NYC, the city's sustain sustainability plan, estimates that New Yorkers generate um, 14 million tons of trash and recyclables each year, and when you realize that 2% of this is coming from plastic bags, you, realize, you start to realize the volume and impact plastic bags have on the waste stream, and plastic bags are such an unnecessary and easily removable part of the waste stream, as you will see from our findings. So compounding this environmental issue is the amount of fossil fuels needed to produce and transport plastic bags. So to produce 100 billion plastic bags, which, as you know, uh, is the number of plastic bags used in the United States every year, um, requires 2.2 billion pounds of fossil fuels, 3.9 billion gallons of fresh water. Um, it also creates 1 billion pounds of solid waste and emits 2.7 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which, as we all know, all have their own contributions to global climate change. So we've talked a little bit about the production of plastic bags, and, but the disposal of plastic bags is also harmful both environmentally, socioeconomically, and financially in New York City. So environmentally, because of their lightweight, even when plastic bags are disposed of properly, they often fly right out of trash cans, littering the street, and ending up in waterways where they, are often, where they often break down just a little bit and are consumed by small marine species, which then are consumed by a larger marine species, and through the process of biomagnification, we know that larger species therefore have more um, of these toxic materials in them. And when human beings eat this, it then becomes a part of our bodies. Um, so this is just to say that plastic bags can actually become a permanent part of the food chain. Um, the harms of plastic bags are also a socioeconomic issue, as they disproportionately affect low-income people. The waste management facilities that manage plastic bag waste are disproportionately located in low-income areas in the outer boroughs. Um, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance estimates that 75% of solid waste facilities are housed in just a few neighborhoods in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. And this is a problem because heavy truck traffic in and out of facilities contributes a lot to air pollution, which contributes to elevated rates of asthma, especially in children. And plastic bags themselves are often more prevalent as litter in these areas as they blow out of trucks and out of waste management facilities. And this is a map of waste management facilities in New York. And as you can see, Brooklyn has 20 stations, Queens has 18, the Bronx has 14, and Manhattan has exactly zero stations. In other words, Manhattanites and New Yorkers produce a lot of solid waste, and only people living in the outer boroughs have to deal with any of the environmental harms that waste management facilities only housed here. Uh, produce for them. 
Plastic bag disposal is also a financial issue, as plastic bags clog storm drains, which then the city has to pay tax dollars to clean up. Um, it costs $12.5 million a year to transport plastic bags to landfills, and uh, plastic bags often jam recycling machinery. This is an aerial view of the Sims Recycling Facility in New York City, which um, basically 6,000 trucks, it's estimated, are used every day to collect trash from around the city and transport them to places like Sims, where they are then transported further through from barges between facilities where they are sorted and then transported again as either recycled materials or um, to be put in landfills. And as we know, all of, the, all of the vehicles involved in this transportation run on fossil fuels. And this is an image of a lot of plastic bags at the Sims Recycling Facility. And we include this to give a little bit of visual context to the claim made by the plastics industry that any environmental harms caused by plastic bags are just easily solved by simply recycling plastic bags, because what a green solution that sounds like. But recycling facilities often cannot handle the volume of plastic bags sent to them, as they are very thin plastic and just clog machines, so they therefore have to be cleaned out and then just get sent to landfills. Additionally, we need to remember that recycling, like anything else, is a market, and plastic bags are made from very, very low-quality plastic, and there just often is not a buyer, even on the global scale, for this low quality plastic, so they just get sent to landfills anyway. Therefore, simply recycling plastic bags is, no, is by no means a viable solution to all of their environmental harms. How do we fix it? Now that we've learned that single use disposal bags are an issue, I'm going to tell you what has been done to address it. What is Bag at NYC? The Bag at NYC Coalition is a group made of over 70 supporters. It was established in 2012 by attorney Jennifer Romer, and for the last three years, the coalition has worked to reduce the number of single-use disposable bags in New York City. These are the logos of some of the organizations that are part of the Bag at NYC coalition. The primary solution that the Bag at NYC coalition has proposed is intro 209-2014 a New York City Council bill that would impose a 10 cent fee on all single-use disposable bags in New York City. The charge would apply to all retail and grocery stores, but not include any restaurant or food vendor. The fee collected from the um, single-use disposable bag would be retained to, by the businesses themselves. In order to prevent the fee from disproportionately affecting low-income New Yorkers, any customer using WIC or SNAP or any location dispensing government assistance programs such as soup kitchens would also be exempt from the fee. There have been several other initiatives across the United States that, um, that address the issue of single-use disposable bag consumption. For example, in Los Angeles, they've enacted a similar bill which charged a 10 cent fee on all single-use disposable bags and since then has seen a 95% decrease in plastic bag consumption. In San Jose, they have, been active, they have a combination of a plastic bag ban and a 10 cent fee on all paper bags. And they have since seen an 89% decrease in total plastic bag litter. Washington, D.C. has enacted a 5 cent tax on all plastic bags and has since seen a 60% reduction of plastic bag usage. Since Washington, D.C. is not a state, it has the power to levy taxes and the money collected from the tax has been used to clean up the Anacostia River, which has once was incredibly polluted. Over 140 locations around the world have enacted policies to address single-use disposable bag consumption. The Bag at NYC Coalition has advocated for a single-use disposable bag fee instead of a tax, for one, because city governments cannot levy taxes, and a fee over a ban because Bag bans require specific plastic um, specific plastic thickness to be specified in the bill, which make it easy for the plastic bag industries to simply create plastic bags that are thicker than those specified in the bill. Bans also make city governments vulnerable to lawsuits from the plastic bag industries, which we have seen in Oakland, California, and other cities around the U.S. Just to give a brief summary of the New York City government process, the mayor is the head of the New York City government. 
New York City is divided into 51 council districts, each represented by a council member. The, um, the plastic bag legislation has already had a hearing, but no committee vote has come has taken place. The bill is so the bill is stuck in city council. 21 members of the city council are openly in support of the plastic bag legislation, while 26 members are needed for it to be passed and sent to the mayor to be enacted into law. The mayor and the city council speaker have both not taken an open stance about the bad legislation, but if they were to support it, it would sway a key number of council members to vote in its favor. And this is where we come in. So, for the last, for this past semester, our group of environmental students have conducted an observational survey of all single-use disposal of bag consumption in New York City. We observed close to 1,500 customers across four boroughs and 27 stores. <coughs> Our group surveyed eight districts. With District 8 being represented by the City Council Speaker, we divided it into two survey sites, one in Manhattan and one in the Bronx. The majority of these districts have District Council members who are not openly in support of this bad legislation. And they're in the East Village, East Harlem, Harlem, Bushwick, Bedsty. Flushing, Astoria, Morrisonia, and the South Bronx. We split up into three groups, two groups with two surveyors and one with three. And at each location, a member would... For three consecutive weeks, each group surveyed one district per week, surveying three locations, a traditional grocery store, a chain pharmacy, and a bodega. For approximately 25 minutes each, two times a week, once on Monday afternoons and once on Saturday, Oh, once on Monday evenings and once on Friday afternoons. We constructed a methodology to try to create the most comprehensive view of New Yorkers' single-use dis single disposal of bag consumption while taking into account or resource or time constraints. We understand that 1,500 people cannot represent the entire 8 million people that live in New York City, but we do believe that our data can give us a good idea of, the, of New Yorkers' single-use disposal of bag consumption. Here's a map of the 27 stores we, 27 stores we surveyed over the last th in three weeks. All the stores we surveyed would be covered by the bill. We decided to omit surveying green stores such as Whole Foods because we specifically wanted to view the New Yorkers' use of plastic bags and because green stores are not prevalent across all neighborhoods in New York City. Part of our survey protocol, um, our group members took down each customer's estimated age, gender, bag and bag type. Our group also added the variables of the total estimated number of bags, bag fullness, and whether a customer had a double bag. Alright, so what did we find? In the three weeks, we calculated an estimated total of 3,397 single-use thin plastic bags. 80.4% of customers were using these bags, making them the most prevalent type as opposed to the 8.2% of customers who were using reusable bags. When broken down into districts, we see that plastic bags were definitely the most prevalent used across all of the districts, with District 21 and Flushing, Queens using the most. Um, in Flushing, Queens, we witnessed a lot of people loading up entire grocery carts full of bags, completely full, and then loading them into their cars and taking them home. Many of the bags that we saw were double bagged, and since these people are driving home, they're not carrying them, so there is no need for these double bags to be used, possibly contributing to the high number. When broken down into boroughs, we see that Queens as a total is also using the most plastic bags. It's closely followed by Manhattan, but Manhattan had slightly more reusable bags than all of the other boroughs. Um, when broken down into store types, we see that by far traditional grocery stores are using the most plastic bags. Uh, it was most common to see double bagging at traditional grocery stores, which is possibly uh, contributing to this whole number. Um, customers at bodegas, as we see, had very low numbers of bags because they generally made small purchases, such as a drink or a pack of cigarettes. We looked at bag fullness by store type and found that at pharmacies and bodegas, the most primary uh, fullness value was low, showing that a lot of times people aren't needing these bags that they're taking. Um, 
Oftentimes we would see customers discarding the bags right outside of the store or taking the bag with its contents and then putting them in their personal bag, also showing that these bags are completely unnecessary. And it shows that the life cycle of these bags is so short that they often end up as street litter. So the overall trends we saw were basically New Yorkers are using a lot of plastic bags. The highest number of plastic bags were used at traditional grocery stores. The majority of bags from pharmacies and bodegas had low fullness. Many customers simply discarded their bags outside of the store, and grocery stores double bagged regardless of bag fullness. Um, all of these show that many of the bags that are being used aren't really necessary. So, what should we do? Given our observations, we have come to the conclusion that Intro 209-2014 should be passed, as legislative approaches have worked in other cities across America and the world. Our findings on the prevalence of low fullness bags at pharmacies and bodegas lead us to conclude that if getting a plastic bag became a conscious financial decision in the form of a plastic bag fee, the person with low volume purchases would mostly forego a plastic bag. However, we recommend a few actions that, in addition to the enactment of this bill, could help reduce single-use plastic bag usage even further. We recommend that the Bagot NYC Coalition, in their attempt to gain public support for this bill, should present it mostly as an environmental justice issue, and the way that waste management sites and their impacts are most prevalent in low-income boroughs. This also makes sense within Mayor de Blasio's vision of the city as accomplishing social justice and environmental equity. We find it important to stress both the environmental harms and the social injustices that come from plastic bag usage and disposal. We recommend that retailers should be encouraged by, bags of, by groups of the Bagot NYC Coalition and the NYC government to educate their cashiers on more sensible bagging practices, such as asking customers if they would like a bag for low volume purchases and only double bagging upon request. This recommendation also follows from our findings on the prevalence of low fullness bags and should therefore be aimed at pharmacies and bodegas primarily. The reusable bag giveaways are often not effective in curbing plastic bag usage on their own. We believe that in addition to the plastic bag fee, more strategically planned bag giveaways should be held in front of traditional stores in low-income areas. Although this is currently be being done in some places, there is no monetary incentive for people to use these reusable bags until the bill is passed. This recommendation addresses the concerns that the bill would disproportionately affect low-income families, as well as our findings that plastic bags were the most prominent at traditional grocery stores. So, over the course of the semester, we have learned that single-use disposable bags are a problem environmentally, socioeconomically, and financially for New York City. Fees and bans have worked across America and the world, and it's time for New York City to act. Our survey provided our clients and everyone with baseline data of New Yorkers' plastic bag usage. Before the bill is passed, this can educate council members on the behavior of their constituents. And after the bill is passed, hopefully, um, this information can be used to assess the effectiveness of it in changing people's behavior. Finally, as a part of our project, we provided the client with an automated database and an updated survey protocol. These resources will assist the coalition in reproducing this experiment in New York and in other cities. So, we'll now take any questions. Thank you for your time. Back. What are the mayor and the speaker's objections? They haven't given any objections. They haven't said whether they like it or they don't like it. They've com been completely silent on the issue. And how do you answer New Yorkers who are not eligible for food assistance, but who, for whom a fee would be a burden? Well, that is why we recommended the plastic bag, or not the plastic bag, the reusable bag giveaways in front of, um, in mostly low income areas, so that these people will have these bags without needing to purchase them, and then the fee would not um, apply to them because they would be bringing reusable bags to the stores. And just two more quick ones. Go ahead. How, um, when you are using the statistics of 2.2% of the New York City waste stream, mm -hmm. which category of New York City waste are you referring to? Solid. So, I mean, household or also commercial? Or there are three distinct streams of waste in, in the way the United States divvies up waste. Household municipal waste is just one. So, if you mean 2% of household municipal waste, that's fine, but that needs to be clear. Yes, household. Sorry, I was unclear. Okay. Um, and then my last question was, there will still be plastic bags? 
So what's going to happen to them either when people bring them back or when they still go to the MRF and gum up the works? Even when it goes from 100% to 95% fewer bags, you still have the bags. So what's the solution to that problem? I mean, the solution, the problem with plastic bags, I think, mostly is the volume of them. It's that there are too many for a lot of the facilities to handle, and I think the 5% of plastic bags is very easily handled. And although it is going to be a source of waste, we're always going to have source of solid waste. And so I think that is just a problem that's going to need to be handled by scientists and the government and um, managing corporations. Thank you. You're welcome. Stephanie. decision so it's really like it's such a mindless decision usually when you just go up and usually you don't even ask if you want a bag only some places will ask you sometimes so it's really just to make it would you like a bag you know you're gonna pay 10 cents and you're like oh actually i just have a can of soda no actually i don't need a bag and i'm not gonna pay 10 cents or yeah i'll pay the 10 cents because i do need a bag um, also um as seen in the other cities they that five cent fee in washington dc has decreased plastic bag usage by 60 percent and the 10 cent fee in san jose or no los angeles made it decrease by 95 percent so even though it's such a trivial amount it has worked in other places and so it should definitely work in new york thanks uh, has baggy nyc considered reaching out to grocery stores to advocate for savings and for uh, providing less plastic bags so if they instituted this program, uh, has the savings been calculated or calculated? It's not even a savings issue. They'll actually be making money off of this because they pay a much lower price for plastic bags. It's like two cents a bag or something, and they'd be making 10 cents a bag. Um, so they've definitely been advocating that. And so cool. Did they get the 10 cents back? Yes. Yes. The store goes to the, the store. Goes to the store. Yeah. So just to clear that up further, so yeah, uh, we didn't make that clear, but the retailers do retain the fee. That's why it also works well as opposed to a tax where the government takes it. And although, like we saw in Washington, it, the tax was able to go to environmental projects like cleaning up the Anacostia River, um, the fee allows the retailers to keep it. Uh, I really appreciate that you guys are making this effort to have a it was probably safer for each of our well beings. <laughs> and second of all, because we would observe a lot less people if we had to go up and talk to everybody and not everybody wants to talk to you. So we had age categories, 0 to 19, 20 to 39, 40, and so on. We had four age categories. So it's kind of that was based on observation and estimation. But um, so we could observe as many people as we could. Uh, also another note on that, we did actually, uh, Louise, made a Java program uh, to find correlations in all of our data. So we did have the age ranges as well as gender, um, but that information, it just didn't seem that useful to us because there wasn't really that step from here, but we do have that data as well. Yeah, so so I have two questions that, actually, that sort of start from the personal observation, that it's almost impossible not to have plastic bags in your life, no matter how much you try to avoid them. They're just, you know, it, it's such a pleasure sometimes to just take something over to someone else's apartment in a plastic bag because they now have to deal with it, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so but, but this leads me to two questions. One is, it seems like from what you said that you had no way of coding whether people were multiply using single-use plastic bags. Is that is that right? Mm, yeah, I, I can't really go into their home and see if they're using right. them as a garbage bag. Right. <laughs> so there could be some fraction of the population <laughs> No, just in terms of the methodology, though, there could be some fraction of the population that is using these bags multiple times. Well, they're probably like using me, them, for example. like, twice, like, using them as a garbage bag, but then once they use it well, as a garbage bag, it goes back into the garbage, and then we still have to deal with that bag. No, so no, sure. using it I'm, again I'm, doesn't I'm, Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. It's just, no, I'm just addressing I'm, that. But I'm just saying it's a category of data that may be small, probably is small, but that the methodology doesn't pick up. And it raises the other question, too, which is, 
Yeah, has anyone, anyone sort of tried consumer education around multiple using these these bags? Do, do you know in any of these campaigns? I mean, it's not a substitute, but it might be an additional strategy. Some of the companies have like, said things that like, people use as like to pick up after the dogs or as liners in the trash cans, but the truth is people consume these way more bags than they need. Um, an average person goes grocery shopping around, even if just once a week, if you go to a grocery store that double bags, there's 10 bags you, that one week. Um, we do understand that bags, some bags are being reused, and the thing is that the plastic bags didn't always exist, so if people now need the bag, 10 cents for a trash can liner or a dog poopy bag isn't that expensive. <laughs> So I just want to be clear, this is not an alternative to what you're saying. It's, it's just another question that's at least worth asking. I mean, if, if every bag were being used twice, that in itself would reduce, presumably reduce the bags by 50%. So. I, don't, I don't think that would reduce it by 50% because they'd be taking the same amount from the stores, they would just be then using it later. Like, knowing that they're going to use it later doesn't mean they're going to double up how much they're putting in their bags and then take fewer from the store. Maybe. Maybe from, from the number of bags that are being produced each year and the number of bags that are ending up in either recycling locations or landfills, the percentage of bags that are being reused, even as a counter argument, is too small to make any environmental, positive environmental impact in the production of single use disposable Can I ask a question about price? Yes. Because you only have 10 cents. So in Aspen, Colorado, when you check out, they charge you a dollar for a bag. And that means you always will bring your bag back yeah. to the grocery store. And you can't leave without paying that dollar for that first bag. So would that be a better strategy to cut down use on plastic bags? I know there may be billionaires in Aspen, but it seems to work. <laughs> I think the 10 cents comes mostly from the perspective that there are um, a lot of low income people in New York. There's, there's, um, and so that would, having that $1 charge would disproportionately affect them. And that's why we've gone for a 10 cent fee because if they really do need that for um, reusing the bags, uh, then they can then afford the plastic bag instead of having to pay a dollar for it. And I also think it would be a lot more difficult to get it past if it was a dollar fee as opposed to a 10 cent fee, just from, yeah, we're, 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 we're struggling with that one. <laughs> of the waste stream and whether or not you see, you know, maybe it takes double the amount of political capital 
but it represents 8% of the waste stream, you know, whether or not you really still, after all this, think plastic bags are the, the lowest hanging fruit with the least amount of social capital really needed. I'm confused as to what the question is. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it only represents 2% of yes. municipal waste. Yes. So that other 98% mm -hmm. truly breaks down into different kinds of, of waste. And whether or not you still see plastic bags as the that slice to go after, given the political capital that will be needed to get something like this passed. Um, I think we see it as a lot of council members are already on board. It almost has all the votes it needs. They're really just waiting on the mayor and the city and the uh, speaker of the council to say something about it. And once that happens, then we'll really know what's going to be needed to pass this bill. But if the mayor comes out in favor of it, it's basically passed at this point. And also, 2% is a small number, but that, like we said, it's calculated by weight. That's volume-wise, that's a very large part of the waste stream. So if you're focusing just on that statistic, it sounds like it's not really um, a good portion of the waste stream to go for. But when you recognize that, that it, it actually, there's 2% is still a lot. 2% of a lot is a lot. And so, and by removing that 2%, by convincing five more council members, that would have a really large effect. And I think our, our findings and the statistics, statistics have shown that. We are out of time. Very sorry. Thank you so much for listening. My Good Home, Wolitia became a motto of our own capstone. So we began our capstone studying the early ecological beginnings of New York and transitioned into urban design and ecological democracy principles. Combining this theoretical knowledge with the current plans and goals of the de Blasio administration, as a class we created sustainability urban planning designs to create visions for a more resilient New York. So as was true for the original Manhattan people, many New Yorkers celebrate the nature of their city, and they understand that the city, city has its own ecosystem, and recognize that like any good ecosystem, the city has cycles, flows, interconnections, and mechanisms for self-correction. So we can learn something from the past ecological states to inform our sustainable future. Everyone wants to have a more sustainable city, but what does that actually mean? Using a particular tool developed by the Wildlife Conservation Society called Vision Maker, we've been drawing on city plans, existing literature, to decide if we can actually accomplish the goal of creating a sustainable city. The more specific question that we chose to focus on was how do we meet one NYC goals in New York City neighborhoods by 2050? So a large facet of Vision Maker that we've been using is the principle of ecological democracy. So ecological democracy in Vision Maker allows for anyone to create designs to create a sustainable city. So thinking of our environment not just as a utilitarian construct, we wanted to focus on the principles of connectedness, fairness, and sacredness in our sites. In all the, in the four different areas of Lower Manhattan, West Farms, Crown Heights, and Forest Hills.
Uh, the graph in the center shows the breakdown of preservation versus new construction. And the graph on the right shows the households served based on income of the plan. So our third goal is green space. Parks, public spaces are essential for economic development and community revitalization. Additionally, our parks and green spaces have public health and environmental benefits to reducing pollution and minimizing the impacts of climate change. Specifically, we're looking to increase the percent of New Yorkers living within walking distance of a park or green space from 79.5% to 80% by 2030. Our fourth and final goal is runoff. As we all know, water is one of the most precious resources, so it must be valued and managed wisely. So New York City intends to capture the first inch of rainfall on 10% of the impervious surface area in combined sewer watersheds through detention or green infrastructure techniques over the next 20 years. Okay. Over the course of the semester, our capstone worked with a platform called Vision Maker. We use Vision Maker to model possible ways to meet these goals in different neighborhoods throughout New York City. Vision Maker is a platform in beta developed by the Whaley Kia Project of the Wildlife Conservation Society, and it is a tool that allows anyone to create and share visions of a sustainable future for New York City. Anyone can access Vision Maker at the website visionmaker.nyc. From here, anyone can create a free account to begin creating vision. You begin by naming your vision, choosing a base vision, either Whaley Kia of 1609 or present day New York City, and then you can use a variety of Vision Maker tools to alter the ecosystems within your vision. <clears throat> the two base vision maps that you can select from, that of 1609 and that of present day NYC, were both created from extensive research and data collection completed as a part of the Whaley Kia project and past capstones. Each cell of a vision represents an area of 10 by 10 meters, and each color represents a different type of ecosystem. For example, the vision to the left shows an area of New York City as it is today. The pink and yellow cells represent a variety of ecosystems that are buildings, such as retail or residential buildings. The vision to the right shows the same area 400 years ago when it was primarily forested, represented by the green cell. In addition to choosing a vision to start from and changing the face of the vision itself, you can also manipulate selectors, and these selectors include the ecosystem, lifestyle, and climate. After making these changes to your vision, Vision Maker will respond with changes in ecological performance metrics. These include responses in the water cycle, carbon cycle, biodiversity, population, and economics. The economics metric is the newest one, and it is still in development. The economic, will res economic metric will respond with an estimate of both demolition and construction costs for the proposed changes in your vision. Our capstone is able to use these Vision Maker metrics to draw conclusions about how successful our visions were in meeting the goals from one and life. Now we're going to look at how we achieve the goals set out in one NYC by using the Vision Maker platform. We created visions in four boroughs to see if we can truly achieve a sustainable New York City. So the first borough that we chose um, was Queens, more specifically the Forest Hills area. Um, so notable facts about Forest Hills specifically is that it was home to uh, 110,000 residents, um, it was three square miles roughly. Um, and what defines this area is that it uh, has more than 50 percent, around 50 percent, single-family homes. Um, it's home to a lot of historical landmarks, and so as a result of that, the zoning laws are incredibly strict. Um, they want to preserve the single-family home aspect and the uh, historical landmark aspect that makes Forest Hills uh, such a unique part. We so cannot hear you in the back at oh, all. Sorry. Um, with specific goals for Forest Hills, um, what we did was we worked within subsets of our neighborhoods. And so the subset that we worked on of Forest Hills, as well as the rest, is about 20% of the neighborhood. Um, based on the four goals from one NYC that we were focusing on, we determined that for Forest Hills, for 8050, we need to reduce emissions by 208 million kilograms per year. We need to support roughly 547 new housing units. We need to add about 18,000 square meters more green space, and we have to reduce storm runoff by around 818,000 gallons per day. Here's an aerial shot of a uh, Vision Maker tool within the subset of Forest Hills. Um, to the left, you can see uh, the tool before the edits, and to the right, you can see some changes you've made um, within the aerial shot that become more apparent. Uh, for example, the addition of 
green space. Uh, here's just a close up view um, of Vision Maker and, and how you apply it. Um, toward the far left, there's a bird's eye view of a corner of the segment of Forest Hills as it is in present day. Um, Vision Maker template is in the middle when you run it through without any changes. Uh, and you can see to the right is the template with edits. Uh, what sticks out most in this is, for example, the addition of photovoltaic cells on the roofs of the apartment buildings, which are seen as these little pink squares. Um, we graphed our results to determine whether or not we met the goals that we were setting out to meet um, within four graphs. And the data from each of the graphs on the x-axis, or the y-axis, corresponds with the, the goal. For example, for green space, it's percent of your population. Uh, we have the current um, metrics for the forest's area. We have the vision maker metrics. And the dotted line is the, the goal. So going above the dotted line means that we've met the goal or exceeded the goal. For Forest Hill specifically, uh, here are the changes that we made. Um, we added in um, geothermal pumps, photovoltaic roofs for the 80 by 50 goal, corresponding costs to the right. Uh, for green spaces, we added green roofs. Uh, we also added park savanna. Um, and we were actually able to meet all of the goals for Forest Hills. Uh, the total cost, according to Vision Maker, for all of the goals combined with the additions is $1.4 billion, or if we're going to apply this to the city as a whole, $3.9 billion per square mile. The next neighborhood is Crown Heights, Brooklyn, a vibrant neighborhood with just over 72,000 residents. It is comprised of large Caribbean and Jewish populations and is home to the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, Brooklyn Public Library, and Brooklyn Museum, among other landmarks. We worked with a subset covering an area of 1.62 square miles on Vision Maker. A larger subset was used compared to the other neighborhoods. Given the lack of open space in most of this residential neighborhood, there weren't many opportunities for significant change in smaller subsets. Our goals for Crown Heights consisted of an 820 million um, kilogram reduction of carbon emissions per year, the construction of 1,729 new housing units, and the reduction of storm runoff by 3.5 million gallons per year. The green space goal was already met in Crown Heights given the district's proximity <coughs> to Prospect Park and other smaller parks. Here, you can see the changes made to the neighborhood. Changes highlighted here focused mostly on the addition of new apartment buildings for the housing goal, sometimes requiring the replacement of single-family homes in certain neighborhoods. If we zoom in, you can see these changes more clearly. The orange squares represent single-family homes. The pink squares represent apartment buildings. In order to meet the affordable housing goal, large-scale construction was required due to the existing low population density for households. As you can see here, we were able to meet all the goals for Crown Heights, um, including a 66% decrease in carbon emissions, almost 1,800 new housing units, and a reduction of almost 5 million gallons of storm runoff square blocks. It's home to just under 5,000 residents, and over half of our population is actually income supported by the city government, which means that we have a really vulnerable situation that could serve a lot from better affordable housing and more green space and diversity. And just as a fun fact about our neighborhood, this is actually the center of the highest population of Puerto Ricans in New York City. So, shout out to all the people. So we had some specific goals for this area of West Farms. Our first one was to reduce our carbon emissions by 25 million kilograms per year. And if that seems a little small to you in comparison to the other neighborhoods, you should notice that our district is very, is a lot smaller in terms of area and space. Uh, our next goal was to support about 130 new housing units in order to house 500 residents. We also wanted to reduce our storm runoff by just under 700,000 gallons per day. And luckily, our green space goal was already met by 100% of our residents being within walking distance of the park. <coughs> so here we can see our view of West Farms within Vision Maker. To the top left, that's just the aerial view of our, um, of our vision, and maybe it's more clear at the bottom underneath that, that's our current view. There's this big purple block underneath there, and that's actually a municipal bus depot. And so you'll see in the next few slides that we tried to take advantage of this big um, horizontal space. And then the bigger vision is our end edit, and at the bottom near the bus depot, we put in some permeable pavers to try to adjust 
our runoff goal. And also in all of our residential units, we put um, green roofs. And I'm not sure if we can make it out, but we tried to um, put in more green space and more bike lanes and street trees. Uh, and these are the graphs that show how well we were able to meet our, um, our goals for our visions. And so unfortunately, we got just under um, 80% for our 80 by 50 goal, so we almost met it, but we're gonna count that as being met. Um, <laughs> we were able to meet our affordable housing goal, our access to green space goal had already been met, and then we were able to meet our runoff goal by, um, uh, by 200% actually. So these were the specific interventions that we had to take to achieve those goals within our West Farms neighborhood. For 80 by 50, the biggest thing that helped for us was to um, add this eco-conscious lifestyle change. It's to change from the average New Yorker's energy <coughs> usage to eco-conscious, which means that all of their energy comes from renewable energy. We also put in green roofs and photovoltaic panels um, to achieve this goal and to get it down to 73%. And you might say, okay, why didn't you guys get it down all the way to 80? And that's because the remaining emissions are from uh, diesel exhaust because there's a huge highway actually running through our district, which would be really hard to take out. Um, we achieved our affordable housing goal by taking advantage of the fact that there are a lot of derelict buildings within our neighborhood. So we instead converted those to be uh, mixed-use retail and residential buildings to also incentivize economic performance in that area. For green space, we didn't have to do anything, but we wanted to. So we updated some of the bike paths and we improved green spaces to be more diverse and resilient and to also go along with some of the plans that the city has for that area to improve bike paths. And lastly, for our runoff reduction, by putting in permeable doors <coughs> in that large parking lot in the bus depot, we were able to reduce our runoff by 20% for rainy day scenarios. And the total cost for our vision for this area was $60 million. Lower, sorry, Lower Manhattan, or more specifically Battery Park City and the waterfront, is the final community in which we tested our one New York City goals. With a population of approximately 100,000 residents in almost the same amount of space as West Farms, most of these residents live in mixed use buildings, and which help establish Lower Manhattan's reputation as a commercial hub in New York City. The zoning laws in this area are building for building, which give us a lot of freedom in determining how high the buildings should be. So our specific goals for Lower Manhattan were to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 114 million kilograms per year, supporting approximately 2,500 new housing units, and reducing storm runoff to 37 million gallons per day. Thanks to Battery Park, our green space goal was already met. Here are our visions, which include an aerial view of Battery Park City in Lower Manhattan, vision maker, um, a vision maker version of what is already there versus our vision and what we and the different in the interventions we implemented, which as you can see include green roofs and biosmells to reduce runoff. Here you can see that we reached all our goals. We barely made the 80 by 50 and the runoff goal, however we did supersede our affordable housing goal. The interventions we took were as other people do, would take on an eco-conscious lifestyle, which would be very probable given that young area of Manhattan. For affordable housing, we did some research on the buildings that were in the area, which include two hotels and battery city parking, and we turned that into mixed-use housing to house more residents and grow our population. For reducing runoff, we included permeable pavers, green roofs, and biosmells and cisterns, which you could clearly see in our vision. And as I said before, our green space goal was already met thanks to Battery, thanks to Battery Park. Overall, this costed $2.021 billion, or $1.8 billion per square mile. So, as you can see in our combined results, the sustainable city is possible. However, if you look to your right, the costs to achieving sustainability are extremely high. This brings us to the question, how do we get to that point? There are some caveats to achieving sustainability. The cost of sustainability changes are high and uncertain. Vision Maker just shows you what it looks like, not how to get to that point, and the models have a level of uncertainty within them. As we saw in the models, 
Lifestyle change is essential to achieving one NYC's goals. 80 by 50, uh, one NYC's 80 by 50 goal. <laughs> Uh, as shown in our visions, lifestyle can change by demanding renewable energy, composting and recycling, and a plethora of other options. New Yorkers can be active and engaged in reducing their carbon footprint. So, we came up with some recommendations for the city of New York, um, and Mayor Bill de Blasio, um, our favorite person. Uh, so, we decided that constructing new buildings uh, for housing is essential, so kind of what we were working with already, and we're kind of confirming this. Um, increasing green infrastructure to capture runoff and distributing green space more equitably is essential. And we also would like to see uh, incentivized lifestyle changes. And uh, for our advisor, Eric, we decided to come up with some recommendations for the Vision Maker platform itself. Um, we would like to see some zoning metadata so that when we're uh, building buildings, we know how high we can build them. Uh, we would like the ability to designate low cost and mixed cost housing um, and a retrofitting option for older buildings so we don't have to demolish it and then build it back. Um, we would also like to see coastal storm flooding, uh, more transparent calculations of environmental metrics, um, some maintenance costs of ecosystems like parks, um, more accurate cost metrics, which they are currently working on, and an undo button, <laughs> which would be extremely helpful. <laughs> but there is no undo button for climate change. We can never go back to Manhattan. However, we can accomplish our goal of a future sustainable city still. With Vision Maker, we can use our understanding of ecosystem services to create a more resilient urban environment for future generations. And we can take some questions. metric for more rich areas of the city and poorer areas of the city. Uh, just as a disclaimer, those the methods that we were undertaking aren't necessarily the most cost effective, so I think it is a little bit unfair to say like this is how much it's going to cost here versus here. Some of us tried to um, put in the least amount of changes as possible, and some of us really took liberty and were like, let's put in a thousand bike paths. So I think that um, that if we were if we did this on it in terms of most cost effective, that would be a better way to compare it. Um, if that helps okay, so then, well, let me turn the question around yeah. and say, if you were doing it to try and be cost effective, do mm -hmm. you think that you would find similar you know cost per square mile across the richer versus poor district? No, and that we ran into has a lot to do with the zoning data of what you can build. So can you do like this kind of tower in the park scenario of having a huge building and for more housing, or do you have to create a lot of smaller buildings that are um, lower height? So it just has to kind of do with the individual characteristic of these neighborhoods that there's no one-size-fit-all solution in terms of our cost metrics. But what we did find in terms of this rich neighborhood versus poor neighborhood is that, for example, for our neighborhood in West Farms, the Bronx, where we weren't quite able to meet our green space, our uh, 80 by 50 goal, that other areas who were able to exceed that goal can kind of make up for our inability and, and maybe our lack of funding to do so. Uh, so I had a question about the zoning um, and whether or not you had, were fully aware of all the different restrictions. And I'm thinking about Forest Hills, which is majority landmark protected. Um, and in the landmark district, you can't uh, basically build things or add things that don't look original, that are visible from the public street. And you have a lot of solar panels, which I know landmarks wouldn't like to see. Vision Maker um, as spoken well before is that it's so flexible in that there are so many different options and you can just say you can pick an area in the city and 
say, okay, we're going to wipe out all of these apartment buildings and add um, a whole big wind farm. Um, and, and they'll let you do that, but when you're applying it to uh, a real life scenario, that may not. They in their heads. As they grow older, they're thinking about them. Mm -hmm. And we can do this, or who knows? Um, well, I know Eric's mentioned before um, when they have showed this um, in, in various fairs and groups, um, they do attract the majority of, of children who come up and they say, oh, it's just like Minecraft and, <laughs> and how interesting it is and how cool it is. And so um, I, I, I'm not there personally, so I can't really speak for the enthusiasm of the kids, but um, it's definitely there. And, and I feel like growing up, if this program could grow with kids and maybe introduced in middle school curriculum or high school curriculum, uh, the possibilities are, are relatively endless, I would say. Microsoft bought Minecraft for one point five billion dollars. <laughs> you get a small slice of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.